So, today I've been a premium idiot. And I do admit I've been a premium idiot. Because I had a video which was... Okay, I was 80% happy with it. And it was ready to go live. And... It didn't go live at 1900 hours today because... Which is my normal slot. Because I decided I was... Wasn't happy enough of it. So I was going to have a go at redoing it. And... Then I went off and had to deal with things. So now I'm actually recording this video now at nearly 20 hundred hours. On the 27th of February. So, yeah. Sorry it's late, but I'm hopefully going to be happy with this one. And the reason for my disquiet was how I treated the US Navy Bureau of Aeronautics. Not exactly an organisation I'm known for being friendly to or actually professing any, any um, admirable feelings for at all. But many do not know quite why I find them so annoying. So let me explain this. The US Bureau of Ordnance, they get rightly quite a lot of flack for the torpedo program they did in the run-up to World War II. And quite how long it took them to do it. And the US as Bureau of Aviation tends to get a lot of credit because of the aircraft which come into service. During the war, some of them, in spite of them, let's be honest, there's the Wildcat, the Hellcat, the Avenger. Actually, I'm trying to think of which aircraft they actually had any hand, a positive hand in the creation of and didn't actually, at the first point, go for something else and try to go for anything else before ending up with... They did eventually get good aircraft and they accepted them when they had them. They actually they actually did do that. Let's, let's go with that. Let's go with that. I don't want to be too harsh on them. And there was always factions with them supporting those aircraft, so so we won't be too harsh. But it's not the aircraft which are, because in the end, let's be honest, they get around to the right thing. It's not the aircraft which are the source of my disquiet. No. My problem with the USN Bureau of Aeronautics comes from the fact they did every effort and by every means possible to make sure their squadrons, in naming and ability to build up a lineage, were joined to another object by an inclined plane wrapped helically around an axis. I.e., for those who needed to put it more simply and straightforwardly, screwed. Yes, I know. Strong language for this channel, which usually uses frigate and cruiser. But it's important, and also I've checked. I did, took a survey of my little cousins. They do all know that one. Mainly because it was a Big Bang joke, so if I use it in that context, shamelessly ripped off Big Bang, it would go, yeah, okay. Quote to Big Bang Theory. Now, the joy of this is because the USN's Bureau of Aeronautics keeps trying to be precise. They wanted to be precisely descriptive of aircraft squadrons. They also kept changing their numbering and changing them around, and this leads us to our second problem. Now, I often get thrown at me by two sides, depending on which side you're on, that either US Navy squadrons do not have a lineage, or they do have a lineage. The argument, the actual reality is, it's both. You see, there are actually rules, and those rules had to be cleared up so recently as 1998. We are talking about 26 years ago, almost to the day. I think it was March 1998, and I do have the actual date in the presentation. They had to actually issue communiques sorting this out. Exactly which squadrons could receive a lineage from their predecessors, and which couldn't. And if that's starting to confuse you as you're going, why? Why is this going? Well, I'm going to be giving examples. But today, this video is about USN's aviation squadron system, how they structured their aviation, and why I can very easily talk about the lineage of squadrons in the fleet air arm. Let's be honest, they're mucked up by different things. So, before anyone starts, considers me, it, it starts writing below. Oh, this is, an, uh, this is a video where Dr. Clark, or sometimes they call me different names, 
is just going to be saying how great the Royal Navy is and how bad the US Navy is. No. No. I, th there might actually be a skit video someday coming out called the 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 Navy's at the Washington tre uh, Treaty. And the Navy's in the bar at the Washington Treaty. But trust me, there is not a, a single Navy on Earth which is perfect and has not mucked things up in some way. It's just the ways they muck them up are sometimes different. And sometimes they're the same, but from different methodologies. It's just beautiful. It's just so lovely. It really is. It's it's it. It takes great skill to be a navy at sometimes. So with that begun, let's go to this. And as proof, because some people honestly think I just make this up that I'm doing multiple drafts. And I'm fairly sure that some videos do actually illustrate that. There is going to be a bit of magic about now. Thank you to everyone who supports this channel. Thank you everyone who likes this channel, who shares this channel, who follows me on social media, who follows me here, who subscribes, who's a member, who does all the things. Thank you. Without you, the channel wouldn't be possible. Without your support, the channel wouldn't be possible. Without the people who are buying book, the book, the channel wouldn't be possible. Um, there are more books coming. They're going to be self-published on Kindle, I think. Um... Probably I'll try and get them out to other e-readers as well. Because uh, I'm going to try and do my own series of books, which no one seems to be interested in. As a sort of series, an ongoing series. And so I'm going to try and do them myself. And if they do well enough, hopefully then a publisher will turn around and go, Yeah, um, we'd like to take those and do the physical books. Because they won't be getting their hands on the digi versions. If I've gone through the effort of setting up all the digital versions and getting them running, No! No, no, no. No one else is getting their hands on them. Not a single jot. I'm not silly. If I've got those up and got them running, I'm not, I'm not handing over to anyone else. But thank you. And thank you to the patrons. Seriously, without you, my book habit and the books that, the, that were purchased for this video would not have been a, a viable option. I have to admit, I'm happier with... Three of the books than I am the fourth book I got. I spent... And this is part of the realistic point of history. Okay? Because I always am honest about what a historian's life is like. And what my life is like. Because... So many people get told this idea that you get a PhD. You've got a guaranteed job. And this and the other. That's not the case. I knew it wasn't the case when I went in it. And I still made a stupid decision. But I love history. I know I realized it was a stupid decision while I was doing it, but I went into it open eyed. I regularly deal with first year students, PhD students, etc., who have no idea of the reality of the employment market in academia, no idea of the reality of the work, of what you might end up doing with your PhD, and the fact that you can do things outside of academia, and that vast majority of you will go into do it. But I love doing this, and I do consultancy to pay the bills when I uh, when I have the time and I do contract lecturing in universities when I can and when I'm employed to do so um, I also do A-level and GC tutoring and run A-level and GC revision centres for a company called Justin Craig occasionally, it's lovely but this channel is all supported by all of you and allows me to buy things like these books which have gone into this video today now these books are all written by Michael Roberts. And they are absolutely cool books. Now, the three of them, together, cost 70 quid. The fourth book, which is a ac very academic book, I will call it. In that it's written in academic naval history jargon, which um, you need to have either spent about 10 years in the subject to have any hope of understanding or you need to have downloaded the author's brain to your own. It's very, very good, but it's very, very much an academic book. Also, there's The Joy of the Academic Books. It costs 140 quid. These, if you're interested in the history of the squadrons in terms of their imagery, their iconography, what they look like and how that's changed over time, are an absolute must-read. And if I was a specific squadron in the US Navy... 
and I was looking at my iconography, I would certainly go, right, and what squadron am I? Let's say I'm a attack squadron. I would want the volume of about attack squadrons because I'd want to look up the history of my iconography. And I'd want to be able to go, ooh, this is what we used to look like. We actually used to get away with that. Yeah, there, there is a group in here, I think it's called the Silent... Uh, the Silent... Um, I think it's called the Silent Knights or something like that. And um, they are... Um, their badges are interesting. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm not saying I don't think they're PC, but I, 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 I'm not sure if the modern US Navy would actually get away with those badges. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous things. So. Anyway. So thank you for your support. It wouldn't be possible without it, and it wouldn't be possible to do all this without your, your kindness. So thank you. So one of the things that's often misunderstood about the development of naval aviation, the development of all aviation, really, is that you weren't just developing the technology. You weren't just developing the aircraft, the ships that would support them, all those things. You're also developing the ways those systems are going to be integrated into your force, how you're going to work with the officers, how it's going to, where the officers are going to come from, where the command's going to come from, who's going to be the command, at what level is the command going to integrate, at what level are the tactics going to integrate, at what level is the force going to become one, because, okay, I'm going to use a, a slightly more modern thing to quote from, but which is stronger, five or one? The thing is, if I have five spindly units, these are five units, yes, but versus one solid force, the solid force wins. And it doesn't matter if the solid force is made up of two and a thumb, okay? Just I, before I do any weird symbols that people are going to claim are things that they're not not, I'm just trying to make a, 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 make a half fist. Um, that looks like bunny rabbit ears. That could be something else weird. Um... Why is it all the people have made these things so weird? Okay, right, let's do that. That's still weird. But, you know, this is the point is, boom, if it's... You can knock them off. You have to have an integrated force. Integrated forces operate together far better. You're far less likely to have blue on blue. Uh, one of the problems with alliances, even permanent military alliances like NATO, is actually force integration and making all the different nations and forces actually be able to work together. It's a perpetual, constant struggle. Imagine how it is to integrate something which is completely new, which has never been used before. Certainly not a level we're talking about. Certainly not a level at which you are going to have whole strike forces. You are possibly going to have battles between fleets which never see each other. For pretty much all the forces, this creates an interesting problem. Now, the US Navy doesn't have carrier air groups before 1937. But that doesn't mean they don't have carrier air groups. That means they have the actual command structure called the carrier air group. And they have it recognised. And instead of it being the senior squadron commander acting in the role, or there being a senior officer aboard a ship who is acting in that role, but are technically attached to the Admiral's staff, or there's about five different systems they try. And this is why whenever I discuss this in a, in a, um, in a presentation, in a, whenever I've done, and I do quite a good talk, I have to admit, I have quite a good PowerPoint presentation on the different command structures of the various care groups in the 1920s and 30s between the British, the Americans, the Japanese and the French and how they are using aircraft carriers in that period. There is always at least one person who kind of goes, actually, they didn't use that structure. And I go, hold that thought. Click on a couple of slides again. So you were you about to tell me it was about this structure, not that structure? And they usually go, well, yeah. Well, yes, that's the structure they used two years later. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they changed structures. And that annoys me. Because that's a problem. That is a real problem to try and follow. To try and work out, well, how are they doing the staff work? How are they creating these things? How are they actually building these forces together? And 
We are going to get into how much trouble the US Navy created for themselves. The Royal Navy has their own issues, and I will get into the whole issues of the Fleet Arm at some point someday. But I already discussed it in the Fleet in the, in the sort of the British Naval Aviation Doctrine scenario. But the thing is, the British technically have a carrier air group commander who is technically the senior, in terms of RAF rank, officer on the air group. But because of the way they get appointed, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not so good, sometimes they're helpful with naval structure, sometimes they don't. And so the Royal Navy ends up with almost a dual structure in that the Royal Navy has a senior observer who is the entirely Royal Navy officer, so you end up with almost the dual command of the air group. You have the senior observer and the senior flying, off uh, flying officer. Or officer of, of, of RAF rank officer. Flying officer is also the name for their most junior level of pi of of pilots. So it's it's helpful using that phraseology. Yes, the Royal Air Force making historians' lives easy since their conception. <sighs> it's fun, but no, the U.S. Navy doesn't have that dual structure, dual issues to deal with. No, they have the fact that carrier groups begin. And then they decide to number them in accordance with their carriers in 1942. And then by 1943-44, there are more carriers available. Some of the older carriers are gone. Some of the air groups aren't gone. They haven't stood them up. Sometimes they're moving them around. And so now the air groups are moving around between carriers and they you know, retain their numbers. Um, but the trouble is the air groups are actually still following the nomenclature of marking themselves up to assimilate themselves with their carrier, not their air group. This causes disputes over aircraft between different air groups. Uh, this causes disputes over issues of identification. It causes all sorts of fun things. And it causes some really interesting, other interesting things to go on. But mostly those things can be put down to trying to deal with a massively expanding system and a massively expanding pool of personnel, many of which are not career naval personnel. They do not have that vast wealth of naval experience of naval service to draw from when they're doing these jobs. They are wartime service of personnel. And that complicates it further. And in 1946, there is a massive reorganization to recognize the fact that, well, honestly, and this might shock you all, because it did shock some in the United States Senate. An escort carrier can't take the same air group a fleet carrier can. It's 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 shocking. I realise. I realise. If you are all in trouble, I will give you a minute to take a drink. You know, calm down, sit down. I realise you could be in trauma now. I realise I could have shocked you. So I want to give you some time to think about that. Okay. And as such, as such, because of that, the U.S. Navy wanted to have different air groups designated differently for different types of carrier. I know, it's just... I mean, the only thing worse than that is socialism. I know, I'm being facetious. But seriously, some of the stuff which went on at one point, I am honestly surprised. Send them to McCarthy, only that he wasn't really involved at this point. He actually joins the Senate in 1947, so he just about manages to miss this. But you could, from the tone of some of the senators involved in the discussions around this, and some notations around the time, and some of the Personal accounts I've read, which were for people involved, but they haven't published those, but very kindly some people have sent me them over the years. Usually after I've gone and given talks and their family members have heard those talks, they've gone, well, here's our father's diary. You can't use it and publish it, but we thought you might find it interesting because it might point you in places where to go. And it does. It's lovely, but of course I can't use it. But it is so interesting to read that there are some senators who are honestly accusing the US Navy of communism pretty much over this because they have carriers which aren't all massive and uniform 
what can I say? We, we like to believe it's modern with politicians who are uninformed about military and security matters, let alone education, economics, or basic facts of life. But it's not. And whilst there are many good ones, I know I have worked with American, British, all sorts of politicians from around the world. I've worked with French, Australian. I've worked with some very good, very diligent public servants, as I will call them. The trouble is, like with most public-facing careers, the small number of bad apples spoil the image for all the rest in the barrel. Because often, they do it so loudly and so badly. Anyway, in 1963, the carrier groups finally become wings. And most of the nom modern nomenculture we associate with the United States, uh, uh, United States Naval Air Aviation comes into existence. It's mostly 1960s, which firms it up. But think about that. You are talking 40-odd years to get from where they began to where they are now, to an extent. And then people turn around and go, why have they not integrated uncrewed aviation systems yet? Well, the starters, they started out as unmanned aviation systems, and now they're called uncrewed. The reason for the change is twofold. One, because, well, let's be honest, unmanned sounds a bit painful. It does. It, you know, anytime anyone says they prefer it to uncrewed, I go, really? You like the thought of being unmanned? I know, I, I know you like traditional phraseology, but that just sounds wrong. Uncrewed sounds far less painful and far less like a surgery. A surgery which I didn't want to be part of, honestly. And the other you know, reason for changing to uncrewed is to make the point that it doesn't have the crew on it. Not that it doesn't have a crew. It's always important to think that through. And, yeah, those are going to take a while to integrate. Command structures, working out how we fit them in, how we put them together. There's been, there was a huge debate when the Queen Elizabeth class carriers were being built, and honestly, the stuff has been included, as far as I understand from publicly available information, about whether or not they would have positions that would enable the integration of command and control for those assets, or whether those assets would be command and controlled from back in the UK, but flying from the carrier. It was decided in the end to fit them on the carrier, so you could integrate them into the air group far more easily. Because whilst you can theoretically have those systems, in terms of those people involved, on something else, to integrate them fully with the crewed aircraft which you might be operating, especially while we're doing uh, the integrated uh, integration era, you you'd have to have so many uh, so much communication going backwards and forwards between the carrier group and the home that any attempt to try and minimise that by making it go, you know by making it as low visible communication as possible would be impossible due to the sheer volume of communication you require. So it's easier to integrate them. Life. It never gets any less complicated. So. Here is the thing. Officially, even if a squadron is formed from with the same designation, the USN doesn't necessarily, in fact, more often not, tries not to recognize the lineage. This was the case up until 1998, where they were still operating on the rules established back in the 1930s. And the reason for that was because, the, uh, honestly, the aircraft could have a very different careers. Now you've got VFA-2 here, which has eight patches. And in its career, four incarnations, and, you know, the most recent has been 1972, which is still going to this day, the Bounty Hunters. Uh, the first was created in 1922, when VF-6 was redesignated VF-2. Note that VF-6 came into existence before VF-2. Yeah. Welcome to the U.S. Naval Bureau of aeronautics 
and they're trying to give me stress. The second stood up in 1927 uh, to 42, and the third served 1943 to 5. Now, the trouble is for VF2, and the reason why the you might say, well, hang on, you know, why is this not lineage period? Well, sometimes it is because units are transferred over. So, in this case, should VF2 aircraft, be uh, VF2 squadrons, be able to associate themselves with the lineage and history of VF6? After all, that's where they came from. No, because that's VF6. Well, I can understand that, but... And it gets even more fun once we get into this. Because VF2, I chose because they're a rather simple one. Okay? They have existed. And they have, while they have now become VFA2, they've mostly been a VF. V being the designation chosen for aircraft which are, which are heavier than air, fixed wing aviation assets. F being fighter, A being attack. The reality is the reason for their obsession with names, and I'll be getting into this, is because of their obsession with accuracy. But the reason for obsession with trying to stop lineage being carried on, despite the fact that lineage itself is such a historical part of a service, and it's something you, you as someone who are a service personnel or anyone, really, you know, one of the things which is moan, most known about humans understood about us is we like to feel part of something greater than ourselves. We like to feel part of something bigger than ourselves. We like to have a sense of history, a sense of belonging. You know, you might be your very large and massive family going back in history. It might be the organization you belong to. It might be your country. It might be your faith. All these things are things which humans like to anchor themselves in, where they have a past and a future, and they're part of something greater than themselves. So unit histories are incredibly important. It's one of the reasons why I actually support the British Army's regimental system. Every time someone goes, yeah, get rid of the cat badges, get rid of cat badges, just maintain cat badges... I can see there's an argument for structure uh, for slimming down the structure. But I think you have to be very careful because those cat badges mean something. They are something for you. They're like ship names. They're like or you know squadron numbers in the Royal Navy. Uh, all these things are ship names. All these things they have meaning. If you're a crewman, if you're a young sailor or a young service personnel, who's coming in to the service at 18, 19. And you've come out of training, you've joined the unit, and you're looking at all the tasks in front of you. If you can look up to the wall, and you can associate with people whose faces are not dissimilar to your own in age, they, they look exactly like you, they've joined up at exactly the same age to serve. If you can look at those images, and know... They are the same unit as you, and they did it. They did it. Maybe in different circumstances, maybe very different equipment than you have, but they did it. They were answered when they were called, and they did it. It gives you something to live up to. I've talked a lot in the past about how elite. Now, half the battle with elite units is the psychology. You tell them they're elite. One of the things with tribal class destroyers, when I talk about them, is the reason those destroyers do quite so many weird things. HMS Gurkha charging the air, the German air attack to drive them off the convoy, the troop convoy they're getting out of Norway at the time. The reason they do that is the crew do not question the commander's. In the captain's instructions, they don't question him. They, they completely support him. It's because they've been told they are tribal class destroyer personnel. And the Royal Navy destroyer crews already consider themselves an elite. The tribals consider themselves the elite of the elite. Which meant, if you think yourself to be the elite of the elite, I am the best of the best, I have to be, you have to hold yourself to that standard. You have to hold yourself to your own mental image. Well, how do they get that mental image? They get that mental image from looking at the crews who've gone before them. They get that mental image from what has been done by others in their place before. 
That is how they know themselves. That's how they live up to that. They have that image in their head they have to live up to. They have to exceed. And that is the thing about squadron lineage. That's where it comes in. And this is where the USN's Bureau of Aeronautics really does muck things up. So much so that it's in 1998, as I've said, that they are sorting this out. And this, by the way, comes and there's a link to it down below. This all comes from the Dictionary of American Naval Aviation Squadrons, Volume 2, Chapter 2. It's basically their Chapter 2 copied out for you to read. So if you don't want to go, follow the link below and go and find it. Just pause the screen and you can read it all. And... It's basically the 19th of March, 1990, uh, 1998. Um, I, there are many things I could say about that date. I'm not going to, but it was. it's a very special date, the 19th of March, 19, 1998. Anyway, it's not just because of this. Not just because of this. Although this was a, f a fine thing to happen on that day. Now, if you go back to the bit where I expanded it full screen, you'll be able to see this, but... I just want to read something to you because here is, there are all the various explanations for the terms establishment, redesignation, deactivation, reactivation. That's one of the reasons why I put the entire chapter on the screen. So you could read the chapter in full. It wasn't just the bit I've quoted from. You can read the full chapter. But here is this paragraph here. Historically, confusion has reigned regarding squadrons that have been assigned the same designation. As an example, since the squadron concept was established in the early 1920s... Conceptually, yes. Um, there have been five separate squadrons assigned the VP-1 designation. Hence, when one speaks of VP-1, you have to ask what time frame in order to identify the correct squadron. Due to confusion resulting from the use of the same designation time after time, with no lineage connection between these squadrons, the new set of guidelines referenced in the above paragraph were developed to end the lineage and insignia confusion. After 1998, when a squadron is deactivated... Its designation and proved insignia will be placed in, on the inactive list. The lineage and insignia of the squadron is retired and remains with the history of that deactivated squadron. A newly established squadron cannot adopt the insignia of a deactivated unit. A unit squadron that is reactivated will use the insignia it has approved for use prior to its deactivation. The records for inactive or deactivated squadrons are maintained by the Director, Air Warfare's Assistant for Aviation History and Publications. Establishment, redesignation, re or activation of any squadron by any Navy Aviation Command will be cleared through N88H, or the Assistant for Aviation History and Publications, for consistency with the historical record. Insignia proposals for newly established squadrons will also be cleared through N88H in accordance with OPNAV Instructions 5030.4E. Here is the thing. I spend, believe it or not, as some of a PhD in war studies, quite a lot of time around the current armed forces. And I spent a lot of time around retired and former members of the armed forces of many nations. And one thing that unites them all is they are all fairly history oriented. They tend to take pride in their unit histories anyway, but they also tend to do their historical studies. They, do, they enjoy their history. So whenever I find... Something like this, where it's specifically required, you will run this past the professional historians. You will go to the professional historians. That tells me that, A, it's very complicated, which, luckily in this topic, I already knew. And B, someone's really mucked this up so much, we actually need people who spend their entire lives figuring it out to actually look at this, rather than people who are passionate about it, but don't have an entire five weeks to spend working it out. Whenever you're having to get professional historians involved in something of this nature, there are problems. And that basically gives you a clue as to both the realities, as it's now pointed out, pre and post-1998, because... Basically decided uh, units which, well, if we go to the previous paragraph, let's, um, under current Navy policy for a squadron designation to lineage, as set forth, 
da 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 da. Once a squadron letter and number have been assigned to a squadron, that letter and number combination can never be assigned to another squadron. As an example, if VP5, a currently active squadron, were to be deactivated, none of the squadron's designations in its lineage could be used as a designation for the establishment of a new squadron. That means the following designations in VP5's lineage could never be used to establish a new squadron. That is VP17F, VP17, VP42, VB135, VPB135, VPML5, VP5. Whilst VP5, if deactivated, could be reactivated and placed in operational status, all the former designations of VP5's lineage will always be associated with only VP5. Hence, the letter and number combinations of VPF, uh, VP17F, VP17, VP42, VB135, VB, VPB135, VP135, VPML5 may never be used again by any squadron other than VP5. Does that make sense to you? Well, let me explain. Basically, the USN has got themselves into a many sprouting tree scenario where... Some units were linked, some units were linked, some units have changed names. We started off earlier with VF6, which became VF2. And this means you have a very complicated layout. Especially thanks to some decisions taken in the 1930s, which then made worse by rapid expansion for war, rapid contraction post-World War II, rapid expansion in the Korean War, rapid mucking around of it post-Korean War, and all sorts of other funds in the Cold War. And honestly, this video is going to mainly concentrate on the stuff which takes place before, during, and before and during World War II, because to include the stuff which takes place in the Cold War... I have to start getting nasty about some people who are possibly still alive. And I have a rule of not being rude about people who are alive. Unless I'm talking to their face. I, I, I consider that fairly. And I will sometimes be rude in general about major politicians, etc. But my view is they are pretty much accepting that by standing up to be a leader. And I never, I'm never going to use swear words or insulting things like that. But I'll be rude about their policies quite happily. But people who were administrators, who most of them, honestly, in the 1950s and 60s, I will be very fair to them, they are mostly trying to rectify the issues created in the 1920s and 30s. So, therefore, to sit there and point out all the issues that they are creating is most is being kind of nasty to them because they've got a system where they cannot just go clean slated they can't just clean slate and go oh lord you're driving me insane we're going to clean slate everything they have to try and work with the existing systems because they've got admirals and all sorts of people around who get very upset about it and i do wonder if the really they managed to achieve the post 1998 thing thanks to the fact that enough of the senior officers who would have caused very mayhem if they had uh, if they um had done it beforehand were no longer around they had um moved away to air and sea new to fly once more in a different plane it makes things easier so here is the squadron organization in the 1920s and if you look at me again, Alex, that looks kind of messed up. Well, that's because they have a 1922 organization. Then they have all sorts of changes between that. And then we get to 1928, where they have another official, which, by the way, survives all the way into January 1929, where they change it. They add some things onto it. I mean, it's it's just beautiful. I mean, it's just it's just pure history. It is it is truly pure history. Again, please look at this wonderful picture, which I got from the books, which I talked about earlier. It's really beautiful, and let's start off with discussing these, these this lovely scenario we have. So they start off in 1922, and they go, "Well, hey, we've got some aircraft. Yes, we've got aircraft carriers for them. No, um, but we've got air squadrons for the Atlantic and Pacific. Like, oh, good. So you've got Scanner Squadrons one and two, which are combined in December 1921 to form one squadron." Which is also why VF2 is considered to come from VF6. Because Scouting Squadron 2 was the original number 2 squadron. But don't worry, 
they do make things even more interesting. Because then you have Torpedo Plane Squadron 1 and Kite Balloon Squadron 1. In the Pacific Fleet, they have Spotting Squadrons 4, 3, and L1. And Combat Squadrons 4, 3, and L1. This is confusing you, don't worry. L1 is a place name holder, which is, uh, is then that they are supposed to have a third squadron, but they don't have it established. And so, during uh, they are due to theoretically lack of personnel, but we'd all actually say it's lack of money, aircraft, or ability to train personnel. So yes, it, in a way, it is lack of personnel. In a way, it is. And Patrol, Patrol Squadron 1. That's nice. So by 1928, they've got more than the USS Langley in service. They've got Saratoga. They've got Lexington coming along. They're both nice. They're lovely looking ships. And um, they're, they're starting to organize themselves up or try and organize themselves up a bit more. And so they have General Order 161. It's always nice when someone has to issue a general order. And this is all done under the first bureau, chief of the Bureau of Naval Air, uh, uh, Bureau of um, Aeronautics, that is Admiral Moffat, who is also always trying to balance the issue of um, politicians. And he finds that he's having to deal with people who are very strange. And if he does not include in the actual designation of the, squ of the squadrons, what they are, they keep asking him, are they spare squadrons? Do you need those squadrons? What do they do? What do you have them for? So he can't go for the British system of, well, we have multiple numbers. You know, they're just 800 series of the combat squadrons, 700 series of the training and support squadrons. That makes perfect sense. You know, we, 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 that's fine. That's the British why they chose 700 and 800 for it is an entirely different interesting conversation but it works but the thing is for poor um, Admiral Moffat he doesn't even have that option open to him he has to go so we are going to deploy this squadron uh, we're deploying this squadron. which is the scouting squadron number one is the scouting squadron are you sure that's the scouting squadron oh lord he wants to start talking about assignment. He, he, he's having so much fun. He really is. And I would also argue that they're also that the fact of creating carrier groups at certain points. We'll get into that a lot earlier than they theoretically have the carrier groups because they have to to try and make it understandable for the politicians and the Senate who's explaining things. But too, but also he do, he does have fun with sometimes his own navy in terms of explaining what the squadrons do, and them going, but you have this many aircraft, so surely you have aircraft available for this mission. Well, no, because those squadrons don't do that mission because they don't have that aircraft. But they're aircraft, so surely they can do that. And you're possibly sort of going, well, that sounds dumb. But again, remember, they're integrating something completely new. And... Yeah, a fighter aircraft can't drop a torpedo. We would all understand that today. But there were some admirals who were sitting there going, well, it's an aircraft. We saw that aircraft lift a torpedo. Why can't that aircraft lift a torpedo? That's bigger. So? Torpedo weighs a lot. So? But it still flies. It doesn't work. And you have to explain these things. And this is the point to which sometimes I have these wonderful people called um, uh, military linguistic cultural historians. Um, they are a very specialist group. They are actually, really, despite their name, quite interesting, although very rare. If you can f actually find one, I don't think there's a single one of them who is a public historian. I does YouTube or um, a lot of public-facing work, mainly because they they tend to get... If they, when they exist, they're sort of, they tend to be very much museum specialists and they tend to hide away in the museums um, because they have a lot of stuff to have to follow through. But I know, I know two actually, which is quite weird, even amongst military historians, naval historians do actually know that many of them because they are very, very rare to find around, find. They're lovely people, but they would tell you that when you're dealing with the Americans, 
when you're dealing with America as a history in terms of military history, they have a very large dose of Prussian history and Prussian military structures and Prussian formation in terms of their, their organization in their national military psychology. And this explains why they start having to have designations, you know, fighting plane squadrons. You can already tell they're VF, 1B, 2B, 3B, 5B, 6B. Let me get into all the letters in a second. Observation of plane squadron, VO, 1B, 2B, and 4B. And all the sort of organizations, VTs, utility squadron, VJ, observation plane squadrons. All these, this is the list of squadrons that you have in 1928. By 1929, they've added on the scouting plane squadrons, VS-1B, 2B, 3B, and 4B, which were presumably around in 1928, but they aren't, really. And you have the VT-5A as well, and all sorts of interesting organizations being put together and being thought about and being developed. And some of these the number combinations really do make fun. VT H D one five. There's a go. What is that squadron? Is it suffering from something? And again, this is part of the history and nomenclature. This is part of the sort of the the USN. You need to sort of name things exactly but also, your some of these numbers they do mean things. Numbers of names, combinations, but also some of them retain their numbers of name combination as the unit unit designation, even after they've changed the meaning of those letters, or after those letters have disappeared from the nomenclature. Because they keep going through rebranding and restructuring efforts. And to give you an example of this, we can talk about some letter designations for aircraft and the impact on squadrons. And this is always a fun thing to talk through, because it starts to explain some of those squadrons. So light and air types are identified by the letter Z, and heavy and air types are letter designed by the letter V. Okay? So, F is for fighting, O for observation, S for scouting, P for patrol, uh, T for torpedo, G for utility. Now, if you remember... When I've talked about the swordfish in the past, that is a torpedo spotter reconnaissance. TSR. That's where its TSR designation comes from. But in USN phraseology, it would be torpedo observation scouting. So it would be TOS. So instead of being TSR, it would be a TOS. To sir. Or toss. Gives you a bit of an idea. And it also did bombing as well, so. Um, but mainly torpedo. So, uh, but things change as time goes on. You know, the V designation for heavy near vehicles. So you get VF for fighting, VO for observation. And these start to come into the squadron namings. VB for bomb. Uh, you know. In 1933, it expands even more. There's ambulance. There's various transports. And it continues to expand. In 1934, they introduced the secondary designations, which meant that you could have VBF, VOS, VPB, VPT, VSB, VSO, and VTB. And again... These start to filter into the squadrons. They start to filter into the squadron designations. Because again, the admirals, and remember it's Admiral King who takes over from Moffat. Admiral King, Ernest J. King takes over as Chief of the Bureau of Naval of Aeronautics. And he even he you can imagine how annoyed he gets about having to explain these sorts of things to some people. So, honestly, you could say that these definitions, and by having them updated to keep things current, but to provide a simple guide for officers to find out what a squadron does without having to ask Admiral King, was actually saving lives. But realistically, 
it just adds more confusion and more chain uh, more variation for us later because you then get another bright idea and this is where things get really fun because certain point they decide let's have the squadron numbers as having the role of the squadron and the number of the carrier they're on that's gonna be a great idea yeah we love it so we have vb2 vf2 vt2 vs2 yay that's our carrier group for, Lex uh, for lexington and then we have it for saratoga as well vb3 vf3 vt3 and vs3 so which one of those is actually squadron free Please tell me, which one is squadron free? Answers below. The answer is they're all squadron free. But from a lineage perspective, that's... Okay. <laughs> Why? Why did you do this to me? <laughs> do you not like me? And please note, at that time, I went hunting through the squadrons which are available. And there's VP4. But that's a patrol squadron. Um, you know, that this is 1937. You might notice that none of the squadrons have got the de the third designation for their aircraft yet. So you, the squadrons are all very simple. What are their primary roles? They're still being kept in that. But the aircraft they could be flying could be a free designated squadron. So that's why you end up with a scouting squadron flying dive bombers. And being part of the dive bombing package, that's or maybe torpedo bombers. But it's usually it's a dive bombers usually. And so you have fighters, okay, uh, but they might have other duties they can do as well. And this is another thing which starts to cause a level of confusion because the letters sound like they should be the same because for the squadron it tells you what the squadron's role is. It tells you they've got. They have got heavier than air aircraft. Cute. Okay, we know that. And they know that they have bombing types or fighter types, etc. But then you look at the aircraft and they might be VBFs. It just... It's adding another layer. And this is before, of course, we get into the Wonderful world of the VCS squadrons, which are the scouting cruiser squadrons. There's even more fun with that because it's actually a debate as to when that actual designation comes into existence. I can find it being used on squadrons in 1937. I can find it on squadrons being used in 1937. There are honestly people, though, who will tell you. That, that's not used in that period. And they were writing books and they have got references for those books. And I don't think they're wrong. There is part of me which thinks it was being used informally to differentiate them from the other scouting squadrons already, which would explain some of the issues with them. But again, remember, they are also VCS2, VCS3, VCS4, VCS5, 6 and 7. And this is before we get into VS-41 and VS-42. <laughs> no, they're supposed to theoretically be... They are su supposed to be carrier groups, aircraft, but they're not, a, they're not given carrier numbers. And there's an argument of, were they the bonds assigned to the battleships? What were they doing? And it just... Life is a never-ending barrel of fun when you're trying to follow these squadron lineages. Knife is never ending. You will keep searching for them. You will keep trying to find them. And they will keep changing on you. Because people keep having bright ideas. The bright idea fairy is very strong in this period in the US Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics, who are leading on these decisions. Often I get into trouble because people think, well, they're not making decisions alone. It's also this, uh, this department and this department. And you are quite correct. There are lots of chefs involved in this particular stew. But there is one chef who's providing the ingredients. And so therefore that is the chef which gets the primary blame in my book. 
It doesn't matter how many people are stirring the pot. If you're the one who keeps chucking in the ingredients to that pot, then you are responsible for what get, comes out at the end. Because you're letting, the, you're letting those other chefs play with that pot. And you're giving them what to mess with. So, they are then reorganized again in 1941. I, the fact that the U.S. naval aviation was as actually as capable as it was in World War II is a never-ending surprise to me, considering how much time their organi higher organization seems to spend worrying over the naming and designation of squadrons rather than the actual training and capability of pilots. However, there is part of me which thinks that maybe Maybe, because they were so busy doing this, they didn't manage to get in the way of anything else being done by the actual squadrons themselves. And the squadron commanders just took the policy of, okay, if they're going to send us whole new documents and rebrand us, we don't care. As long as they don't use that incredibly obsessed bureaucratic mind to actually interfere with our running of our squadrons, we'll take it. In which case, bravo to the squadron commanders, you made the right decision. Concentrating on getting your aircraft and your air crews ready for air, for operations, rather than trying to stop the Bureau of Aeronautics being weirder than ever. And you would think, you would you would honestly think that this is where things would sort of end. That we just continue on with the policies. And we continue on with sensibly keep following these policies. The trouble is they don't. Not only do they reorganize in World War II and they are moving around with different carriers and wings and there's all sorts of new squadrons coming in and the whole idea of numbering all the squadrons the same and get, thankfully gets dropped at certain points. At certain other points they try and raise it up again. Some people have bright ideas, what can I say? Um, honestly... King was obviously not as scary as he's often marketed as being because, frankly, there are so many bright idea people around in the U.S. Navy at this point in various organizations, which he himself had been in charge of. Remember, he'd been in charge of the Bureau of, Bureau of Aeronautics. They were still around, still having those bright ideas that, obviously, he does not live up to his reputation. A man who was apparently very even-tempered, he was angry all the time, according to his own daughter, was obviously just not angry enough. A phrase I never thought I'd be saying. In 1941, they officially rec recognized VCS for cruiser scanning quadrants, but it's already been sort of in existence since 1937. And there are some orders which seem to cite, uh, cite it and suggest it's being created, but others which disagree with that, and it's just, it, it, it's just a bundle of fun. VF for Fighting Squadrons, VB for Bombing Squadrons, VT for Torpedo Squadrons, VS for Scouting Squadrons, even though Bombing Squadrons and Scouting Squadrons often operated the same aircraft. VJ for Utility Squadrons, VX for Experimental Squadrons, VP for Patrol Squadrons, VN for Training Squadrons, VO for Observation Squadrons, and VCS for Cruiser Scouting Squadrons. And I have to say, some of these Torpedo Squadrons are frankly gorgeous. In their approach to what the kind, uh, their um, their insignias and how they come up with them, I I love the number of knights, and you can trace quite a lot of these squadrons back to the source squadron by the knight nomenclature, holding a torpedo as a lance. But what's really interesting to me is, of course, the primary Japanese torpedo was the long lance for their ships, and then it's. The USN is putting torpedoes being used as lances on carried by so many knights as they're the symbol of their torpedo bomber squadrons. That's just it's something which has always which has occurred to me as a you know pretty interesting quirk of history. It's a quirk of history. During the Cold War, even more happened. As said, they mainly spent their time trying to reorganize the joy that had been the 1920s and 30s. And it just continues to get more interesting. I will say that, yes, squadrons do have some impressive lineage. They have tried to link through some of them. But since 1998, and I have 
been lucky enough to hear something from those involved in the jobs, uh, mostly secondhand, I have to admit, of organising the history and putting the history together with Squirtle Lineage, it has not been an easy task to decipher it and decide. Honestly, that's a sad thing, though. That is a sad, sad thing, because those squadrons, they could do such a great job. You know, we're talking about squadrons which were the crux of the U.S. Navy's aviation capability in the beginning of World War II. And some of them, the lineage is so muddied. They cannot use them. And I haven't done an exhaustive search through current US Navy squadron in service to see if they have managed to find a way to use them all. I must admit, I haven't. But having looked at the information, I'm not surprised if that's the case. Um, it might be in the years since they have managed, but my last conversation about this with someone who was actually involved in the process was about five years ago. So I don't think... I haven't heard of any major US Navy squadrons being... And the sort of... If they manage to get them all back, that's the sort of thing which history... Historians would have picked up on. It would have gone around our networks quite heavily. I, I'm fairly certain I'd have seen stuff about it on Twitter. Or X is now called. But I would also add that the iconography of the squadrons became even more important in the Cold War. It became even more a part of who they were, of what they were, and how they felt about the world. How they approached the world. How they reflected upon their service. I've always found it rather amazing whenever I've had the, and I would say pleasure, mostly, of meeting US Navy aviators, just how quite obsessed they are with their squadrons. In the UK, the common discussion is over regimental cat badges, which I've already referenced in this discussion, so I know I'm about bringing it up, and how pr much pride the various personnel in the British, from the British Army have in their regiment, or their corps, depending on what they belong to. Um, the really large corps are especially proud of it, and that's the Royal Logistics Corps, for those who don't know. The really large corps. They are very proud of their units. But US Naval Aviators... I've met them, they, they literally have their squadron patches tattooed on them. They will still have the patches they will still sew onto clothing they wear long after they've retired. Because being part of that unit, living up to the identity of that unit, means so much to them. It's a big thing in the U.S. Navy culture. It's special. It truly is. And I am at some point going to try to do videos breaking down some of the lineage of these squadrons and going through their history. But honestly, those are going to be bonus videos which are probably going to turn up at things like when I'm going off on trips or I'm not going to be able to be do my normal level of lives or things like that because of circumstances over this year. They're my, in my head, extra videos for any trips which, sh which ship shape do as a crew or something like that. But before I could do them, I needed to have a reference video to point you back to this is what happened in the 1920s and 30s and this is where the entire mess originates. Because lots of people kept having bright ideas and reorganizing things. And the thing was, they didn't come up with a system at the get-go that they could easily expand upon. Or rather, 
they did have a system they could expand upon, but they decided they wanted to try a new system, and then a new system of that, a new system of that. Every time they got a system working and were expanding on it, they decided because they expanded it, they needed a new system. They were like most modern companies. Every time they expand, they decide we have to have a new command structure. And we have to get in outside consultants to reimagine us. Rather than necessarily working with what we have and maybe adding on to it, we're going for a completely new uh, new design. And whilst I would agree, there are certain points at which you, when you grow in an order of magnitude and scale, that it's worthwhile doing that. There are times when, frankly, it's better to just grow the existing system. At least provides some level of continuity. And sometimes it's doing a mixture of the two. Anyway, I'm supposed to come up with a question for the end of these videos because I always do a question at the end of these videos. And the really interesting thing to me was, what would have happened, do you think? What do you think the US Navy would be like today if they continued on with this system? Whereby the different roles of the squadrons were designated and their numbers were the same numbers as the carriers. They were. Because it intrigued me. I actually don't think it's necessarily the best or smartest system at all, uh, in, under any shape or, shape or form. But... It does intrigue me as an idea. And when you add in the fact that you had the carrier groups, the, car the carrier groups were numbered after the squadron, after the carriers as well, you would theoretically have, let's say, let's take Saratoga, CV3. It would be squadron free, carrier air group free, carrier free. Or Enterprise Squadron uh, v uh, VF6 of CAG uh, of CAG6 of CV6 or 666. That's the point at which I could really upset some Americans by suggesting that uh, the old joke of the devil looking after his own might be a reason that uh, Enterprise survived, considering her original numbering of her air group, etc., was 666. Once you Work through that, but I'm not going to go there. I don't want to upset a load of, a lot of people. Could certainly explain something to do with her machine spirit, but we'll leave that to one side. There again, then we have war spites, and that opens up an entirely different can of worms and worries. We're going to go move her past that quickly. But the point is. What do you think of this system had carried on? Do you think it would be useful today? It's for me. It's an intriguing system. I don't think it would have worked, but that's my view. So I'm really interested in you, in your opinions. I'm quite being quite kind here. I think it wouldn't have continued on as a methodology. I I think the whole thing gets very confusing. If you're referring to is sixth on its way, do you mean the carrier, the squadron, or the air group? I'm just asking if six is on its way. Which six? Six! They're all six! Just, just could confuse a few of us. A few souls. A few souls could be very confused by it. Mainly dyslexic souls. <sighs> what do we have coming up? We have Age of the Seaplane Carrier. That's really World War One. That is really World War One. And, of course, we're going to get to Ben Maishri. Which I, I I do know I realize I wind people up by pronouncing like that, but you have to come from my background to know why I do. I'll explain in the video. So I've got some links down below on this video, which have organization naval aviation, dictionary of American naval aviation squadrons, some sources to use, the books being used that you now are nicely pictured here. These are some of the sources I've used for this information. I've got also some very academic books, which I mentioned in the discussion at the beginning of sources, and I love them dearly. I have one which I bought specifically for this topic. I have another on the early American Navy in the 1920s and 30s. And they are lovely books, but they are so steeped in naval history jargon that, frankly, 
I cannot in good conscience recommend them to anyone. They, A, the cheapest one, sent me back 140 quid. So I don't in good conscience recommend such books to people unless they are doing a level of study for which demand, which requires spending that amount of money. Um, so basically they're going to do it as a profession or as a, you know, it's an academic requirement they're doing it for their PhD or it's their professional requirement they're doing it, they're doing published works, etc. or something like that. Then it's a case of you can justify that book. Other than that, no. Please don't. It's it's just the way to bankrupt yourself. Um, it's kind of like any profession. There are there are certain there are always these texts in most professions which you have to just buy, and anyone who's not doing it at that at a professional level really shouldn't justify the cost. They should save their money, and you know invest it in something to make them so uh, to give them long to longer term security. I don't recommend crypto or gold, but that's because I've had family history of going after gold and another family member who went after crypto more recently. And neither's done well, so yeah, I wouldn't recommend those. But that's just a family history. I would say also those books, they are sufficiently written in jargon. You'll need to have read about another two dozen to three dozen books to be able to really decipher what they say because they don't explain their jargon. They expect you to know their jargon. It's the joy of academic books. They uh, try and they, they introduce these things which make a sort of barrier to entry and then they complain they don't sell enough books and you go I might have an idea. Anyway. But thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you do find this interesting. As said, this is a ba has been a baseline video for me to discuss these things. And then I'm going to try and do some squadron histories for some US Navy squadrons. And they're going to come up at certain points throughout the year. Um, various points when I'm busy. They are probably not going to cover building work, period. <laughs> because I probably will be recording them while building work period is going on. If that ha when, if and when that happens. Should do, hopefully. Hopefully moving house soon. Thank you very much, everyone, for your support. Thank you very much, everyone, for backing this channel. It wouldn't be where it is without you. And thank you. Take care, and hope you enjoyed.